Well, I know the Lord has some things on my heart that I want to share with you. If you'll come in your Bibles over to John in chapter 5, I do want you to know that healings have already started in this room. And it'll be up to you in one sense to go ahead and check yourself, check where you had pains that you came with to realize that they're already disappearing, check certain symptoms that you've had to realize that they're already going. God's doing things in this room, going to continue to do things in the room. Amen. Amen. I just want to stress so strongly that God wants to come off the pages and move through your life and bring great change. Amen. Amen. God wants you to see him for being the God that he is. Now, we've heard a lot about God, but we, we want to see him do what God does. Amen. And you know, God wants to be seen. Paul even made reference to the fact that when he was over in Athens, you know, and you remember there, Paul was in Athens, and he was looking all, at all those Greek gods, you know, and they had all their, their, their uh, little transcriptions underneath, you know, their statue. And there was one, there was no statue, it said, to the unknown God. Well, Paul got up and preached a message about, about the unknown God, in him we move and live and have our being. Well, it sounds really nice, but he didn't talk about Jesus Christ crucified, raised from the dead on the third day to give us life and baptize us in the Holy Ghost with power. Now, I know his little sermon was good, but it didn't really convert anybody. That's the only place where Paul didn't start a church. And the next place he came to was Corinth. And we know what he said over there in Corinth in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians. He said, I'm not going to come to you with words of man's wisdom. Why? He'd already done that at Athens. And it didn't go over so well. You know what they said at Athens? Because there's a bunch of Stoic philosophers there. And Paul just kind of fit back into that old way that he used to do things. Remember what Paul said? He said, I, I burned. I burned all my certificates when I found Jesus. Because when I found Jesus, nothing else compares. So he let go of all of his earthly knowledge and his study to grab a hold of the reason why Jesus grabbed a hold of him. But when he got over there to all those Stoic philosophers, he slipped back into a philosophical mode. And nothing happened. You know what they said? We'll come back and hear you again on this matter. That's not what Paul wanted to start a church. I'll come back and hear you. No. Paul always would bring the message of Jesus Christ crucified and raised again as the Son of God. And that blood that was shed for our redemption, praise the Lord, that we're now the redeemed of the Lord. And what did God do with that message? He brought signs and wonders following. Paul said, I'm not, I'm not coming to you in, in man's wisdom, but I come to you in a demonstration of the Spirit of God and power that your faith wouldn't be in the wisdom of men, but would be in the power of God. Think about that. One translation said, the showings off of the Holy Ghost. If there was a flashy personality of the, of the Trinity, it'd be the Holy Ghost. He'd be the one with the flashy tie. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. So what does God want to do? He wants to show off. He wants people to see him. Amen. God didn't create hide and go seek. If he did, he'd be hiding places we'd never find him. <laughs> Amen. No, God created show and tell. He loves to show up so you've got something to talk about. And the more you talk about him, the more he shows up. The more he shows up, the more you talk about him. And guess what? That's the pattern for all eternity when we're with him. He shows up on the other side of his loving kindness and grace toward us in Christ Jesus. We get to see a new picture of what it looks like to be in Christ. And it's a different picture than we've ever seen. And just like God can bring so many snowflakes that all have a different pattern, it's going to be eons and eons and eons of this, and it'll never wear out that we'll see something new out of God. And what will we do? We'll talk about it all day long until we see it again the next day. Come on, God wants to do things in this room. There's rotator cuffs, amen, that he's healing right now. Praise the Lord. Lower backs that God's healing right now. Praise the Lord. Amen. People's livers are being healed right now. Amen. Eyeballs are starting to see. Someone, you're going to look down at your Bible, and you're not going to have to do so much of this. You're going to actually see it. That's why this service is going on right now. God wants to show up. So let's just give us some scripture to see some things about what we want to share tonight. And it's about hearing and seeing. Or you could say seeing and hearing. 
So as we look here, it says in chapter 5, verse 19, and this is right here the uh, Message Bible first, and then I'm going to read out of the Amplified. It says, so Jesus explained himself at length and said, I'm telling you this straight. The son can independently, can't, let me say that again. The son can't independently do a thing, only what he sees the father doing. What the father does, the son does. The father loves the son and includes him in on everything he is doing. And I like what it says next, but you haven't seen the half of it yet. For in the same way that the Father raises the dead and creates life, so does the Son. The Son gives life to anyone He chooses. Neither He nor the Father shuts anyone out. In the Amplified, it says, So Jesus answered them by saying, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, the Son is able to do nothing of Himself of His own accord. But he is able to do only what he sees the Father doing. Let me stop right there and say this. Isn't it interesting that Jesus says the Son is able to do nothing of his own accord? And yet the truth of the matter is Jesus could do anything he wanted to. Isn't it interesting to see that Jesus was so connected to God's plan, it was as though he couldn't do something even if he wanted to. So committed to his father's will, it was as though even if he wanted to do something wrong, he couldn't. But the idea is he had a free will. He could have. I mean, at the Garden of Gethsemane, remember what he said? Father, not my will. Thy will be done. For what did he say? Lord, let this cup pass. He did have a human will, you know. He did have human desires, you know. But it's as though his commitment was so strong, it's as though he couldn't even do something. That should be encouraging for all of us that we can be connected to God in such a way that things that seem so easy to do, which are an error, become as though we can't do them even if we wanted to. Is it possible that doing the will of God would become just second nature? That it would become easy to do the will of God? I know that if you ask your flesh about it, you'll probably say no. Right? But spiritually speaking, isn't it interesting that you can be that connected that we can hear things like this? It goes on to say, um, for whatever the Father does is what the Son does in the same way. The Father dearly loves the Son and discloses or shows Him everything that he himself does. And he will disclose to him, let him see greater things than these so that you may marvel and be full of wonder and astonishment. So my first point is we go on to John chapter 12. You can turn there, John 12, verse 47. My first point is to bring out tonight, Jesus didn't do anything unless he saw it from the Father. And he went on to say, the things I've done thus far, God's going to even do greater things that you may marvel. And in the Amplified, it says, he's going to allow me to even see greater things so that I will do those greater things. Now, I want to get this point across because, you see, the way Jesus operated was as the prototype to the new creation. Jesus came to reveal us in us. In other words, he came to show the world what it looks like when God steps inside of a human body and starts to live. And that was the revelation of the Apostle Paul. He said, when Jesus was crucified, I was crucified with him in so much that it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live out of his faith, his ability, his desire, his love, and so on and so forth. It's not Paul's life, it's Christ's life. One translation said, I've died, and now I'm enjoying my second, second uh, um, existence, which is simply Jesus using my body. An interesting thought, isn't it? Now here's my point. If the Father showed Jesus the things that he did, won't the Father show us the things that we are to do?
I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Let's stop right now and just, just take care of this, this right here. Jesus did function according to the word. Do you remember over there in Luke chapter 6? where it said that he healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying himself took my infirmity and bore my sickness. So do you see that Jesus healed the sick according to what was already preached and spoken by the prophet Isaiah? Does that make sense? And how about Jesus when he stood up in the synagogue and took the book of, of Isaiah and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. Is Jesus operating according to written words that were in Scripture? Yeah. Absolutely. But is that the only way that he operated? No. And if that's the only way we're operating, we're missing the advantage of the Holy Spirit to, on a daily basis, show you things and tell you things that are in line with biblical truth that you've learned that then become the inspiration for you to do what? To do the works and see the results. Answer me this, was it not the Holy Spirit that inspired men of old to write the scriptures? Yes. Was it not the Holy Spirit over in Peter that moved upon men of old to write the scriptures? Yes. Then wouldn't it be the Holy Spirit that would inspire you to move today to fulfill the scriptures? You say, why are you preaching on this? Because if you don't open a person's heart and mind to the idea that God could, then you'll not be what? Available to hear or see. Now let me ask you a question. What's the possibility God's showing you things all the time, but you don't recognize that it's him? See, by the results we see in the church world, you'd say God's not necessarily really motivated to do hardly anything. That's one of the reasons why we can run amok the idea that the only way the Spirit of God is going to move if it's according to His will, as the Spirit wills. See, we'll preach on that, and you don't see much happening, so what that does is you come to a conclusion real quick to say, He doesn't will very often. Where'd y'all go? Huh? Huh? And then guess what happens to people that experience God? It becomes more of a lottery ticket kind of scenario. You're one in a million. And if somebody has a lottery experience where you win, somebody else says, well, you know, it doesn't happen very often because it's as the Spirit wills. And that individual, if he did win, would never think he could win again. Because that would be too much to ask for. When the real truth of the matter is, Jesus, amen, became the lottery winner for everyone. And everyone gets a ticket and everyone wins. Come on in, Willy Wonka. There were about six tickets, weren't there? The golden ticket. Every Christian gets a golden ticket. And everyone's invited and everyone wins. But if you don't believe it to be so, then we just mosey along doing our Christian thing. Seen very little, not expecting much at all. See, there's individuals in this room already where pains disappeared. I know that. I don't have to have lay hands on you to know that. If you just stop for a second, you can feel it right down in your own bones. God's moving in this room. See, there's somebody in this room, you've already had a picture in your mind of running when you can't run, of moving on that ankle when it would hurt. And where'd that picture come from? You tell me. Did the devil tell you to run and get, get healed? Why don't you go ahead and move that ankle and get healed, the devil says. I don't think so. Were you trying to have a picture? Were you trying to have that kind of thought? No. See, God's trying to inspire people. It's supposed to be this natural. Let me ask you a question. Can you hear your own self think? If you can hear your own self think, you can hear God think inside of you. What would God's thoughts be like inside of you? The same as they are written down here in this word. 
All right, praise the Lord, since we're jumping and shouting like Pentecostals, let's just go to the next point right here. John chapter 12, verse 47. Amen. You know, I can see I'm making an impact. All right. Uh, it says in verse 7, 47, if anyone hears, this is the message Bible, hears what I'm saying and doesn't take it seriously, I don't reject him. I didn't come to reject the world. I came to save the world. But you need to know that whoever puts me off refusing to take what I'm saying is willfully choosing rejection. The word, the word made flesh that I have spoken and that I am, that word and no other is the last word. I'm not making any of this up. The father who sent me gave me orders, told me what to say and how to say it. He did what? He told me what to say and how to say it. Do you think God's talking to anybody here tonight? Amen. And it says, and I know exactly what his command produces, real and eternal life. So what's he saying? When you get a word from the Lord, what does it produce? Results. Now we've got a whole book of words that he gave to other people, and much of that is for us. In other words, Paul's message that God gave him was directly for us to hear that message. Then we've got other passages where they're messages God gave to others as examples to what we can expect ourselves. When God talked to David, when God talked to other prophets in the word of God, it's for us to look at and say, well, that's how God sees me. That's what God wants to do in my life. But now get over to the conversion of actually being what? Open enough to hear and to experience. Not just being filled with knowledge. You know, the idea of Christianity is not being able to debate somebody about your idea versus theirs. The idea of Christianity is to be able to show them the results of what you believe. Amen. 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 Look over at John chapter 3. So what do we know about the ministry of Jesus? Everything he did is because he saw the Father do it. Everything he said is because he heard the Father say it. That sounds like it pretty well takes up from morning when you wake up till nighttime when you go to bed. And the next day as well, doesn't it? So what's the possibility from this moment on and this year can become a year where you hear him regularly and you see him show you to do things on a regular basis? Amen. If we don't preach this and get you tuned into this frequency, because it is a frequency, God 101 FM, that God made in the Garden of Eden. It never went anywhere. It's just mankind created all kinds of other stations and have been for so long that there's thousands of them. And, and God 101 gets, gets kind of swallowed up. You know what I'm saying? Come on. I'm making light of this, but at the same time, it's true. God hasn't left. He's not gone anywhere. He still does what he does, just like he's always done it. You've got to tune into that frequency. How do you tune into anything? Becoming aware of it. If you don't know that grace is available, you won't look for it. If you don't know what it is, you won't know how to look for it. But the moment you find out that God's grace is available, what it looks like when you find it, what it does for your life when you experience it, then you can have an open heart and open mind to experience it every day. You know, I didn't know that around the corner was this most amazing barbecue place. Well, I've lived here all my life and haven't taken advantage of the fact it was right around the corner. Well, now you know it's there. So if you only have it one more time in the next 10 years, that's on you. But you got to be told that it's there. And you have to be shown what it's looked like. So that you can even have an openness to have it every day. Who's ringing in the ears already stopped? Yes, can you hear clearly? Isn't that nice? There's been ringing in your ears for years and years and years, and right now you're hearing perfectly, aren't you? Isn't it nice not to have other noise and static? Isn't that fun? We started talking about tuning in, and God tuned your ears in just like that. <laughs> and I didn't see you on your knees doing 10 Hail Marys or any. you know what I mean? I mean, I, you were just sitting there, weren't you? 
Mind your own business. Did you come to church tonight thinking I'm, I'm going to sit on the row so I can raise my hand and interrupt the service? Did you come here thinking that? No. Hey, Amen. You don't look like somebody that I have to send the ushers after. You know what I mean? You said she is an usher? Well, praise the Lord. So there you go. Lord telling off on her. And she got healed just like that. Anyone else? Ringing in the ears stopped. Come on, for years and years. Can you give me a figure on that? Years, like 10 years or more? 20 years? I mean, you're only 30 years old, aren't you? You're 70? Amen. So how many years have you, has the ringing been there? Well, I don't want to make you work too hard at it. I mean, is it over 20? Since 1976. How about if you've had ringing in your ears, extra noise in your ears, like, like you're trying to tune into a radio station and you got static since 1976 and you're sitting in a service and it just disappears. What will that make you feel like doing? You know, you can usually have a much better meeting if you can find the town drunk. You know what I mean? I'm just, it just helps. Praise the Lord. You all know her? I was, I was meeting these folks. Do you all know her? Hey Amen. Is she normally like this? Just crazy like that? No. Praise the Lord. Come on, that's worth somebody right there in your tailbone being healed. Right now. Somebody in your tailbone being healed. How would you know? Well, usually it hurts when you're sitting down, or if you need to, just, just be real demonstrative. Why don't you stand up and flop yourself down on your seat and be healed or hurt, one of the two. Huh? Somebody with your tailbone. Thank you for just enjoying the Lord like that. I'm surprised someone else didn't go with you. In healing school and prayer school, when people would run like that, our ushers ran with them, sometimes for one reason and sometimes for another. But we would run, they'd run with them. Amen. So some of you ushers, the next time somebody runs because they're healed, don't be sitting there. You get up and run with them. <laughs> Amen. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Praise the Lord. I didn't want to run because I'm preaching. <laughs> Come on, somebody's tailbone. Who's being healed in here? We'll go on to the next scripture in just a moment. You've he you hear scriptures around this place all the time. How would you know if your tail, is there somebody that came here tonight, there's something wrong with your tailbone? Did I just have too much pizza before the service? I didn't have pizza. Someone back there, what's going on? You fell down the stairs on your tailbone. And so has it been real sore or bruised and it's hard to sit down? Is that right? And so uh, do you sit down real tentatively? Has it been like that for a while? How long? Since New Year's Day. Amen. What about it right now? Have you tested it out? Well, then you're the one that needs to take a leap of faith. Huh? Okay, well, so the people that are sitting right around, you hold her seat down because these seats flop up. If you flopped yourself back down, you'd come on the edge. Well, that'd be a real good way to test that thing out. Amen. Maybe hold it up. No, hold it down for her, and on the count of three, you just flop yourself down in that seat completely. Now, don't break it. You know we'll have to take up another offering, all right? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Amen. Well, remember, remember, every ticket with Jesus is a winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. All right, well, you all are doing okay tonight. Now, let me ask you a question. If God can get in your tailbone, can he get inside your brain? Yes. All right. Praise the Lord. You having, a, you having a migraine right now? You're on the verge of one, okay? So when you flop, at the same time you flop, all that ver on the verge of it will disappear too, all right? And you'll know within seconds that I'm either telling the truth or I'm just full of it. One, two, three.
Now get up and do it a little harder than that. That's not de demonstrative enough. You just jump up and just take your feet out from underneath you on the count of three and flop down. One, two, three. Do it. Amen. Now, do it about three or four more times just because you can. Come on, you're the one that raised your hand. It's your fault. Do it again. One more time after this. One more time. Now, in all of that, based on how you've been, how come it's not hurting you? It is a little sore. In what way? Don't describe that too much. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's take that back. Sore meaning that it's, that it, that it's been the same sore as it was, or is there a change? Okay, without feeling it, there's a change. In other words, without doing that, it feels good, where it didn't feel good before. And by doing that, there, there's a little bit of soreness you can feel. All right, you know what I would do? No, I'm not you, but it's me. I would keep doing that and press the issue. That's right. Because I know I'm well. That's right. That's right. So no one will think any of it if you want to just jump up and do some more of that. <laughs> and then you raise your hand and let me know when all of it's completely gone, all right? Anybody else? There was another hand back here somewhere with somebody. Now you're not raising it because you saw what she did. <laughs> Come on, who else? All right, we'll get to that. Amen. Anybody else as far as the tailbone is concerned? Praise the Lord for what he's doing and what he's going to continue to do with you. All right? But don't just stop by sitting there. Wait a little bit, then go up and do some more. All right? Why? Because you can. Look over in John chapter 3. Come on, we're just starting and having some fun here in this service. It's 8 o'clock. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you exactly where we're going to get out, but we're not just staying here just to stay. We just really want to make a few points so that it becomes real simple for all of us to receive, okay? John chapter 3, verse 31, in the Message Bible says, The one who comes from above is head and shoulders over other messengers from God. The earthborn is earthbound and speaks earth language. The heavenborn is in a league of his own. He sets out the evidence of what he saw and heard in heaven. Now, if you take that he's in a league of his own, that's because no one else was born again at that time. Let me ask you the question. Uh, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, what did he say in verse 3? You must be born again. One translation said, you must be refathered from above. Another translation said, you must be born from above. So what does it mean? When you're saved, your spirit's saved right out of the heart of God. God makes you brand new from above. So see, when it talks about Jesus is from above, we're of the earth, the moment you become born again, you're from above as well. How do you know that? Paul said he raised us up to sit together with him in heavenly places. What is he trying to prove? That in Christ, we're just like Jesus. So you hear a verse like that and you take one little statement and say, see, the heaven born is in a league of his own. I've been born again, haven't you? Yeah. Then you're heaven born. Yeah. Now what does it look like to be heaven born? Notice what it says. He sets out the evidence of what he saw and heard in heaven. What does it mean? But Jesus is seeing things from above and hearing things from above and takes that evidence and reveals it to people on the earth. And when people see it, they'll say things like, oh my goodness, that's a God work. <coughs> Can you see that? Do you think the Lord could share things like that with you? Do you think the Lord's talking with you tonight? What kind of things is he saying to you? Concerning healing, what's he trying to show us? That maybe Jesus already took your infirmity and already bore your sickness? And how easy is it to yield to your body, to look to your flesh, and ignore that Jesus already took that infirmity and bore that sickness? Let me share it to you like this. In my travels, in my time, in 33 years of ministry, when people hear out of their relationship from God confirm what they already know to be true, you always see results. I'm going to say that again. 
When people hear from God what's already confirmed in the word, they'll always get results. Do you know that it was never supposed to not be that way? We weren't supposed to just be out on the naked void of just taking the scriptures alone. The Spirit of God is always the revelator. He's always the one that brings revelation, that gives you insight into the Word of God. And when people's hearts are open to God, you read a scripture, the Spirit of God will bear witness to you that that scripture is right, or he'll speak to you audibly, or he'll give you a word in your heart or an impression to your mind. And that confirmation, you always see people walk in divine health. Now, if what I just said is special then we better figure out how in the world to get that. But if what I just said is the most natural, normal thing for a parent and a child, then maybe we're overlooking and missing the most obvious yet simple expressions of God to our hearts on a daily basis and going without seeing the manifestation of what Jesus already gave us because we're not paying attention. I had one teacher get literally irate because of preaching things like this in healing school and seeing all kinds of healings, and he got up and preached against it and said, to think that we're not seeing the miraculous because we're not paying attention. Well, duh, (laughs) anything in life, if you're not paying attention, you're not going to be real good at Early on in our marriage, you know, you have to learn all kinds of things about your spouse, you know. You think you know everything before, you know, when you get married, but then uh, it takes about a month once you're married to realize you don't know near enough. <laughs> so Aaron said to me, hey, I, I'm busy making, you know, supper. Would you mind going and getting a few extra items? Well, I was like all in. Yes, I'd go. I'll go hunt for sure. Because, you know, as a 29-year-old, I got married when I was 29. I'd been cooking for myself. And all of a sudden, someone decided she did a whole lot better job than I did. I was thrilled, you know, to be able to eat something that actually had taste to it. (laughs) So she gives me five items. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. And then I said, okay, I'll be right back. And she says, no, you need to take the list. And I said, I don't need your list. (laughs) She said, well, no, you need to take this. I I don't need your list. I got it. Like as though what? I can't remember five things? (laughs) So I headed for the door without the list. Why would I need the list? And I started driving, you know, it's only about a mile and a half away. And within that mile and a half away, I had to encounter Oklahoma drivers and I grew up in New York. Now, in New York, we we drive loudly. We use our horn. And somebody cut in front of me, and I just went, "Mm," and I don't just go, "Eh, eh." I go, "Eh, eh, eh, eh." you know what I mean? I mean, you just, they know. And when I left, because, you know, she said take the list and I didn't want to take the list, I made myself a little ditty. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Because I wasn't going to forget it now. And when I laid the horn on, eh, eh, number one, number, number three, number, number five. Now I started getting a little nervous. Where'd number two and number four go? Later on, I found out that guy that cut in front of me, he took them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Now I'm at the store, and I got number one, and I got number three, and I got number five, and I thought, what would number two and number four be? And then I thought, well, number one, number three, and number five, this is the ingredients. I thought, well, then probably this will go with that. And then I thought, and probably this will go with that. I got it. And I went back home, you know, walked in, and I put those on the counter, and then walked away. And before I could get to the door, she said, what's this? I said, it's number two and four. How come I didn't, didn't make it out of the door? Because she had the... Now I'm more inclined to take a what? A list. 
Just a dumb illustration to say, what you forget, what you're unaware of, you don't participate in. My goodness, if we forget about God, we're not aware of God, it's really easy to what? Miss the things that are right in front of our face. Why wouldn't it be? Let's go a little bit further here. Look over at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 to 14. Where's Miss Tailbone back there? <laughs> you thought I forgot about you. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God's working on your tailbone. Amen. amen, sis. You're not leaving out of here. You know what that thing brews like that? No, amen. amen. What he started, he's finishing. Right. Amen. If you want to jump up and run around like mama did over here, you do that. The ushers are going to go with you. Don't be worried about it. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, it says in the King James, New King James, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of only milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. Unskilled. Think about it. What's he trying to say? The Christian life is a development of a skill. How do you develop any skill? By working with it in repetition. Isn't that right? And he goes on to say, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use, one translation said practice. For those who practice, their senses become exercised to discern both good and evil. What is that telling us? You can become sensitive to the things of the Spirit by practice. Amen. Yep. Amen. Every single day, opening your heart up to the idea that God's speaking to you is one of the reasons why you're actually going to hear. Yes. Amen. Every day, looking for God to show you something is the reason why you'll see. I mean, literally twiddling your thumb, say, well, when it happens, brother, it's going to happen. Well, most likely it ain't going to happen because that same attitude is the way that you've got where you got. So opening your heart up in faith that God wants to show me and he wants to talk to me is the reason why my heart is prepared or you could say the reason why I'm engaged to experience him. Over there in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well, Jesus made the comment, those that worship God must worship in spirit and truth. Remember that? And in the Message Bible it says, you must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. Engage. My middle daughter, Drew, when she was 16, we wanted to get her a little car. We had just enough money saved up where we wanted to just buy it outright. Happened to be at a friend's in... Um, uh, in Texas, and uh, he, he had a little a car shop, you know, with some cars that he sold, and he went to an auction. I'd never been to an auction, so he invited me to go, and we went to this auction, and there was this little yellow Audi TT. It's a girl's car. <laughs> and it came by, and it had a perfect, uh, beautiful little uh, uh, paint job, and had... Um, chrome wheels on it, nice leather interior, and it was right at our, our uh, uh, price range where we could, we could bid on it. And so, and you know, it, it had quite a few miles on it, but still it's, it was in good running condition. And, and I didn't pay attention on the inside to look and see that it was actually a six-speed. <laughs> now this will date you, but how many of you uh, learned how to drive on a stick shift? Okay, and back then, because we're all then in that age group, back then it was either a three on the tree or a four on the, that's right. See, I know exactly kind of where your, your age group is, because that's all there was. And back then, how many of you remember, there were no front wheel drives. It was rear wheel, and we drove in the snowstorms in real wheel drive with a stick shift. Huh? And we were good at it. Until somebody told us she can't do that anymore, and then no one can drive, you know, with a rear wheel. So I was fine with it, but then I'm thinking, I'm getting this for Drew. 
And I sent her pictures and she said, oh, that's nice, you know, couldn't wait to look at it. And when I finally got it home, she looked in there and she got in for our first ride and she looked and she said, what's that? <laughs> and I said, oh, honey, that's the clutch. And this is what she said, she goes, do I have to use it? <laughs> and I said, well, it all depends. I mean, if you want to sit in the garage and just room, 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 you know the car, I said, go nowhere. I said, you don't have to use it. I said, but if you actually want to go somewhere, you have to use it. She said, how often do I have to use it? I said, how many, <sighs> count how many uh, numbers are on that little, that little stick shift right there. She said, there's six. I said, you get to use it six up and you get to use it six back. She said, in, in how, how much a period? I said, all within one mile. She said, what about the next mile? Then you get to do it all over again. She, I said, I don't know if I'm going to like this. It only took 15 minutes for her to say, I ain't driving this. And guess who had to drive the girl's car? <laughs> there was only one time in that whole year and a half that I felt like a man. That's when, that's when a yellow truck pulled up next to me. I thought, hey, man. <laughs> you got to engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. Do you hear what I'm saying? You got to engage. There's a practicing of these things where you notice the things of God and you begin to hear and you begin to see. Look over real quickly at John chapter nine. Come on, getting to the end of what we're saying here so that we can just start ministering to people. John chapter nine, verse 35. This is about the man with the blind eyes. Jesus put clay on his eyes. See, I made that lady flop down in a very padded seat. And Jesus spit on the ground and made clay and stuck it on somebody's eyes. I haven't even gotten close yet to the ministry of Jesus. Think what I could do. <laughs> Notice what he said. This is the Message Bible. This is really good. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and went and found him. This is that man that got healed. He asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man said, well, point him out to me, sir, so that I can believe in him. Jesus said, you're looking right at him. Don't you recognize my voice? Master, I believe, the man said, and worshiped him. Then listen to what this says. Jesus then said, I came into the world to bring everything into the clear light of day, making all the distinctions clear so that those who have never seen will see, and those who have made a great pretense of seeing will be exposed as blind. What did he come to? He came to make all the distinctions clear so that you would see. Jesus didn't came to come to make this thing difficult. He came on the contrary to make it so simple it was like normal. As normal as a development of a child to see and a child to hear their parents is the normal development of a son of God to hear him and to see him. For some reason, we've made this thing difficult and we've tried so hard through the law and works and trying to perform our way into God doing something for us instead of just being a child where it's expected, of course he does, he's dead. And hearing his voice ought to be just as simple as you being in a crowd when you were a kid and you heard your, your dad say, Jimmy, and immediately you knew it was him. Maybe God's speaking to somebody right now. Maybe God's saying something to someone right now. One more verse as a platform to what we're gonna say next. John 14, 18 to 20 in the Message Bible. I will not leave you orphaned, I'm coming back. In just a little while the world will no longer see me, but you're going to see me because I am alive and you're about to come alive. What's the you're about to come alive experience called? Being born again. What happens when you're born again? You're now what? Alive to the Spirit. And what Spirit? The Holy Spirit. What Father? God your Father. Amen. You're not alive to some other spirit where that's your most natural voice. You're alive unto your Father. Come on, what did Jesus say about his children? He said, they know me, they hear me, and they follow me. And the voice of a stranger they will not follow, for they don't know that voice. 
come on, the voice that we most likely on a regular basis out of our flesh follow is the voice that Jesus says, we don't even know that voice anymore. See, I'm not talking about your experience in life because our experience in life, we could say, well, you know, I haven't really heard God very much in my life. A little time or two here and there. But I really have heard those voices of the world. They call to me all the time, and sometimes it's very hard to resist. That's the experience of your flesh. I'm asking you right now to be the spirit that you are, the spirit that is perfect before God. God's talking to you not about your flesh, but about your spiritual connection to him. And he says, out of your spirit you know me, and your spirit no longer knows the voice of the one that you used to know. Does that make sense? Over in Romans chapter 6, 10 to 11, in the Message Bible, it says, when Jesus died, he took sin down uh, with him, but alive he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language and means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue, and you hang on every word. God speaks what? Your mother tongue. Is there anybody in here you speak uh, Spanish fluently? Anybody? Or you speak another language? You speak Spanish fluently? Would you come up here, sir, real quick? Just run up here. Come on, run up. Is there a microphone? There is. I want to do a little experiment here. You speak fluently? Okay, so you could, you could praise God in Spanish? Okay. Testing, one, two, three, one, two, three. I haven't done it that much in Spanish. Well, that's okay, that's okay. I don't care if, if you make mistakes, <laughs> no one will know. No one will. <laughs> Testing, one, two, three, one, two, three. Check, check, check. Is this on? Testing, one, two, three. I, is it on? See if that's on. Hello. Okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to talk... At the same time, he's going to praise God in Spanish. And I want to see what happens. You ready? Okay, sí. go ahead. Sí. When I was a little boy, gracias, Dios. Gracias I had tu, yellow hair and we would play hide and seek. Poder, and I never was able to get away from being caught because gloria, everyone gloria, said, gloria, no, gloria that's you, Dios. Jimmy. Gloria, You've got gloria, yellow Dios. hair. I saw your yellow Toda hair. Gloria, All right, gloria. stop for a minute. What did you hear? Did anybody hear something about hair? You did? All right. He was speaking too, you know. And he wasn't just talking about yellow hair. He's praising God. And you heard about yellow hair, didn't you? Now let me ask you to do this. This time do this. Try not to listen to me. Okay, you ready? Go ahead. I had a little brown dog, and I took my red wagon, and I'd go over to my friend's house, and I'd have to go through their white picket fence. But we played on the green grass. It was a great experience, and my dog, he just loved my friend. All right, stop for a minute. Did you guys hear anything else? Did anybody hear about a brown dog? Anybody at all? Did anybody hear about a white picket fence? How did we get my dog over to my friend's house? Does anybody know? In a little red... You guys were trying not to hear that, though. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it very much. appreciate it. Thank you. Isn't that interesting that even when you were trying not to listen to your mother tongue, that you still heard it anyhow? And we say we can't hear God. God's voice is our mother tongue. Especially if you were paying attention to it, how much more would you hear every single detail? Why? Because it's your mother language. Amen. You know, when Aaron's with me, I have to be engaged. Because guys, have you ever been with your wife and you weren't engaged and they said something to you and you weren't listening and then they have to say something like, what, you're not paying attention? You don't care what I'm saying? Why aren't you listening? And that's all it takes for you to say, oh, I'm listening now. And then they might even say, no, I'm not going to tell you now. 
And what does that do to the next time? You really want to listen, <laughs> right? You want to be engaged. So to be engaged means you're what? Focused. You're paying attention. Now, when you're paying attention and I'm with her, wouldn't I expect that I'm going to engage in some type of conversation, which means she's going to either tell me something or show me something. Isn't that a part of having fellowship or having a relationship? So what part about being with God when he never leaves us and he never forsakes us? Because when I'm not with her, you should see the thing, the jokes I tell on, oh, excuse me, on the road when, no, I'm just kidding. No, when I'm not with her, think about it. Am I trying to be engaged to her when she's not with me? Well, that would be silly because I'm not going to hear anything and she's not going to show me anything when I'm not there. It doesn't mean my heart has departed, but as far as my ears are tuned into her, they're not. As far as my eyes being tuned into seeing her, they're not because she's not there. But when she's there, I want to be engaged enough that my ears are listening that when she speaks, I say, yes, hon. It doesn't mean she's talking the whole time, but when she does speak, I'm listening. When she does show me something, I see it. Jesus is with us every once in a while. He's with us always. And whose voice would you rather hear than his? What, what vision, what impression, what imagination in your mind's eye would you rather see but his? I'm telling you, he's showing you that you're healed. He's telling you that you're well. He's speaking to you that you've overcome. He's giving you a vision of your victory. He's showing you that you don't have to be afraid. He's giving you vision on how strong you are all the time. Come on, if you're a person of the word, then the Holy Ghost is there to bring light to the word. How does he bring that light? Through vision and through hearing. This is the seeing, hearing life of Jesus. How many, how many failures did Jesus have? Well, you could say it like this. Zero, the only piece of people he didn't heal were people that didn't want him. Everybody that came to him with a willing heart, what did he show us? He always had results. So if Jesus is with you at all times, how many of you will agree with me that you can believe that he's trying to say something to you and show you something? Yeah. Did Jesus ever walk into a situation where people were open for him to be the answer and there was a problem and he left the answer unattended to and kept the problem still a problem? It's kind of like my buddy that was taught the algebra. He was a good redneck down in El Dorado, Arkansas. He said, they tried to teach me the algebra when I was growing up. He said, tried to make me find out what an X and what a Y was. He said, well, I care what an X and Y was. He said, on the final exam, he said, X plus Y equals 49, figure it out. He said, I got so slap happy, I walked right up, took my page, slammed it on the teacher's desk and said, I got the 49. What do I care what the X and Y is? <laughs> when you got the answer, it doesn't matter what the X and the Y is. When Jesus is the answer, don't matter what the equation looks like. My goodness, amen. Whether it's 48 plus 1, whether it's 52 minus 3, if you've got the 49, what does it matter what the problem is? You've got Jesus. I'm telling you, if Jesus walked into a place where there was a problem, he was the answer. He always brought solutions. If you've got a problem today, if there's something that's not the way that it should be, God's speaking to you and he's showing you something. Brother Hagin lay on that deathbed and he was trying to figure it out. He finally saw it. I see it, I see it. I'm trying to have it before I believe that it's mine. He said, it is mine. I believe I'm healed from the top of my head to the soles. And when he saw it correctly, all of a sudden the Holy Ghost spoke up and said, now you believe you're well. He said, that's right, I do. The next thing he said was, well, people ought to be up at 1030 in the morning. Look at what the Holy Ghost was doing by, share, by speaking to him and showing him something. Immediately when he began to see truth, and that came by the Holy Ghost, then the Spirit of God spoke, the Spirit of God said. I'm telling you what, we're missing these little innuendos which become the greatest strengthening to your faith and the reason why it works, because God is real. Somebody in this room, amen. Praise the Lord for just a moment. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord.